Thank you so much, Dave. It is wonderful to be with you here today from all around the world. And as we go along, I'm gonna share my screen with you. I'm going to be asking you a few questions and then you can ask me questions as well at the end. And we're going to be doing it using this link. So this link is already in the chat. You should be able to just click on the link in the chat or you can type it in if you want to. And you can do this on your phone or your computer or anything that's connected to the internet. If it asks you what your name is, don't worry about that, just push skip. The only thing you have to do if you're typing it in is make sure that you spell Catherine with two A's. Um, and when you do, you'll see the first question that I have for you, which is, just give this a minute to activate, which is a map of the world where I've asked you to click on where you are joining from today. Uh, because it's Monday morning, it's taking the software a little bit of time to catch up. So if you could click where you're joining from today and you can see a number of people already have. So it looks like we've got good representation from Canada, Southern Ontario and BC. And I know the map is, is quite small. So, you know, your finger just has to land somewhere close to where you are. Um, quite a bit from Europe. We have uh, one from Africa there. All right. More from the UK. Excellent. A few more from the US. All right. So now, now I have another question for you. And this question is a little bit more difficult. You're gonna to have to answer this question with one word rather than just clicking. So just a second here. The next question is this, in one word, why are you here? Why are you attending the Arasha Festival? Why are you um, here for this talk? Why are I'm you here. here today? And what you have to do is you just type in one word. I know it's hard. <laughs> it's easier to use more words often, <laughs> but just one word. All right. You, as you can see, now you understand why it's one word. It's because it's a wordle. So everybody has a different answer. Their video is off. I just need to make sure of that. Okay. Yeah. And probably good to mute everybody except for me, Sarah. Yes. All right, so this is a wordle, so you can see that a couple of people have answered family, learning, community, love, okay. and inspiration. Oh, and then there's a lot of other words like um, hope, passionate, calling, healing, friendship, staff. Excellent. All right, so at the end, this is how we're gonna take your questions. We're not taking questions yet. So if you have questions, just hang on to them for now, but I'll let you know once the questions open because I'm gonna ask you a couple more questions um, this way as we go along. Now, I am a climate scientist, uh, but due to the nature of this conference, I'm not going to spend that much time talking about the science. Now, just um, a few months ago, back in the fall, I did give a full seminar for Arasha USA, where I specifically talked through what is happening to our world, how do we know it's humans, how do we know it isn't a natural cycle or volcanoes or the sun, what exactly is happening? And <clears throat> Brittany, I'm gonna ask you, if you don't mind, put a link to the recording of that Arasha USA talk in the chat. So if you're looking for more details specifically on the science of how do we know that climate is changing and humans are responsible, that video is already recorded and you can watch it and share it if you'd like to too. But today I'm gonna start by focusing, first of all, on what we believe as Christians and how this relates to the issue of climate change. So beginning at the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis 1, there's a verse that many of us are familiar with because we learn about it, you know, as a child in Sunday school, we learn about it as part of the basis of our faith. Um, God says, let us make human beings in our image, make them reflecting our nature. Now, I don't know about you, but all of the years that I grew up in the church, that I grew up in Sunday school, in youth group, in Bible classes, attending sermons and conferences and talks, I heard this verse many times, but it tended to stop right there. It didn't continue. I didn't realize until much later that there was a so that there, there was a why, there was a reason that humans were created in God's image. And that reason is for us to, and I'm using the Hebrew word here, rada, to rada every living thing that moves on the face of the earth. So we were created in God's image for a reason to do something. Now, the reason I'm using the Hebrew word here is because often people use the King James word, especially dominion, and that is used as an excuse. 
It's using an ex excuse to say, well, God put us in charge so we can do whatever we want. But we know not only from the meaning of the word, but from the way it's used throughout the rest of the Bible, that it may mean dominion, but it does not mean domination. It means authority and rule for a reason. And so if you just look at where this word is used elsewhere in the Bible, it's very clear that the word is not being used as an excuse to subjugate, to extract all of the resources from, to use something for your own profit, to colonize something. Here, for example, it's talking about God's rule in Psalm 72, and it talks about may he also, rada from C to C, the same word, why? To deliver the needy, the afflicted, him who has no helper, to have compassion on the poor and the needy, and the lives of the needy he will save. So this concept, which is developed further in Genesis 2, the concept of Abad and Shamar, the concept of taking care of the garden, of being caretakers, this concept translates into the idea of stewardship or creation care. And we often think of it in vivid pictures like this one. Imagine if someone who you loved more than anyone else in the world and who you esteemed more than anyone else gave you a piece of property that they had handcrafted, that they had meticulously cared for, that they had designed every part of. They gave you that and they said, I want you to Rada it. I want you to abad and shamar it. I want you to have dominion over it. I want you to care for it. I want you to protect it and keep it. And we took that property and rather than caring for it, we decided to extract every penny of value from it and to leave it a crumbling and broken ruin. And we said, oh, well, when it's all used up, we'll just go back to the person who gave it to us and say, okay, it's time to push the eject button. We're done. Maranatha, Lord, come soon. Well, of course, that's not consistent with the way that this is portrayed throughout the Bible. What's consistent is if we are given a piece of land that someone values and we are put in charge of it, that we invest it in it, that we make sure that the soil is healthy. We make sure that it can grow crops to feed people and support livelihoods. We make sure that it has habitat and ecosystems to support wildlife, plants, and animals. This is again the concept of stewardship or creation care. Here's the challenge that we run into though. In the Christian world, this often suggests that creation is somehow separate from us as humans. In the secular world, when we think of environmentalism, it even, it even portrays the idea that we'd rather protect a tree or a baby seal than a baby human. But I don't think that God ever intended there to be such a hard defining line between creation and humans or between the environment and people, because what are we other than part of creation and part of the environment? We humans are living things too. We are not designed to float around in outer space without the resources that this planet provides. We depend on this planet intimately. We are part of its environment. We are part of creation. We need the air that our planet provides. We need the water, we need the food. Our health depends on the health of the planet. So it isn't a case of caring for creation or people. It isn't a case of caring about the environment or humans. We are all part of the same system. The planet's health is our health. And this past year during COVID, that concept has been brought home in spades. Why do we see processes like zoonosis happening? It's often because of pressures on habitat. It's because of the way that we treat both wild and domestic animals. The health of the planet truly is our health as well. And that's a big part of what we believe too. So I wanted to talk specifically about how climate change affects people and how we as Christians think about that. I'm not gonna talk any more about creation care beyond what I've already done because so many people have already covered that so well. I wanna build a little bit more on the concept of fossil fuels, climate change, and how that directly relates to our environment, to our planet, to our health. When we talk about this, we don't just start with climate change. We have to start with where the whole problem started, which is when we figured out how to dig up and burn massive amounts of coal and gas and oil to power our industry. Now, of course, those brought us tremendous benefits. The average human lifespan in the UK doubled 
in just 300 years, from 40 to 80 years. And a large part of that was because we're able to power our society now with sources of energy rather than just human power or animal power. But when we extract fossil fuels, when we burn fossil fuels, and then the results of burning fossil fuels, all of those affect our air, our water, our food, and our health. They affect that for humans, and they also affect it for every other living thing on this planet, the very ones that we are to care for and protect. So just a few examples. Let's talk first of all about extracting coal, gas, and oil. What happens when we do that? Well, when we do it at industrial scale, it poisons our air and our water. If you live in the Appalachian region of the United States, if you look at the bottom there, you can see a picture of how they extract coal. They cut the top off mountains. What happens when you do that? It turns out that it poisons the local water supplies. The very people who earn their livelihood working in those mines and in that industry, they are being poisoned by the heavy metals and the toxins in their water that lead to increased incidence of cancer, premature death, heart failure, uh, uh, premature birth and more. We know that where I live in, in Texas, we know that carcinogenic chemicals used during fracking are polluting the water and leading to increased risk of earthquakes. We know that in some countries like Nigeria that have ample oil and gas resources, the pollution resulting from the extraction of oil and gas is so significant that there have been hundreds of studies published on it. And of course, those who suffer the impacts are not those who reap the benefits. So this is just the extraction of fossil fuels. But then when we burn them, they produce air pollution. That ugly thick smog that we see sitting over cities, that's coming primarily from burning fossil fuels. Why does that matter? It matters because it is responsible for nearly 9 million deaths per year. Let me put that in context. In April, we passed a tragic milestone. In April, we recorded over 3 million premature deaths around the world from COVID. But somehow we're missing the fact that every single year, not just during a global pandemic, but every year, we see an average of 9 million deaths per year from the air pollution directly from burning fossil fuels. And there's additional premature deaths from pollution of water, pollution of soil. And as you would imagine, as you can see from this article from the Lancet on the left-hand side, most of those deaths occur in lower and middle income countries where people have done the least to contribute to the problem. Even in rich countries, even in Western Europe, even in North America, people who live in poor neighborhoods tend to be overexposed to air pollution. Why? Because that's where the factories or refineries or the garbage dumps might be located. They have less access to health. They might have to spend more time outside. And there's even a correlation with COVID. It turns out that if our lungs have been exposed to air pollution over years and even decades, then when we're exposed to coronavirus, we're more likely to get COVID. When we get COVID, we're more likely to get sick and even die from it. We have seen the same pattern around the world. We've seen it in Asia. We've seen it in Europe. We've seen it in the United States. And in fact, just to give you one case study, in the United States, in the city of Chicago, for example, about 30% of the population in Chicago is African-American but almost 80% of the COVID deaths were among the African-American population. And studies suggest that it's likely that air pollution is the biggest part of that link. Now, we often hear, and I hear this quite a bit in Christian circles, especially in North America. We hear people say, all right, so you're saying that fossil fuels produce air pollution that's responsible for illness, sickness, and premature death around the world. But don't you know that over 700 million people live in energy poverty today? A large number of those in Sub-Saharan Africa and in Southeast Asia. And don't you know that fossil fuels were what led us in North America, in Western Europe, and currently in China and India, leading us out of poverty today. I do know that, but that was 200 years ago. 
And just as we no longer use party line telephones and Model T Fords, in the same way, there's no reason to continue to use the old dirty sources of energy that we used in the past 200 years ago during our industrial revolution for an industrial revolution in 2021. Especially when last year during COVID, 90% of new energy installed around the world last year was clean energy. Why? A big part of that is because when you look at the places that don't have access to electricity, to energy, those places don't have massive amounts of fossil fuels either. If you look at remaining resources of fossil fuels, the majority of them are in North America and Europe and the Middle East, some in Latin America, Brazil and Venezuela primarily, Africa and Asia Pacific. Those countries that do have those resources, like China, are doing something very unfortunate. So China understands the impact of air pollution on people's health. China is massively investing in clean energy. China has more solar and wind energy than any other country in the world. And, so, and China has decreased its coal use, but it has increased its coal production. Why? Because it is going to countries around the world and is saying, let us fund coal-fired power generation in your country to give you electricity. Why? So we can sell you our coal. The answer is not for countries that, that have energy poverty to do it the same way that we did it 200 years ago. The answer is to leapfrog over to clean sources of energy that do not pollute our air and our water and do not make them financially dependent on the already rich superpowers of the world to continue to power their economy into the future. We haven't even started to mention climate change yet. We've only talked about fossil fuel extraction and combustion. And for every way that it impacts humans, obviously it affects the natural environment as well. It pollutes coastal wetlands, it pollutes the air, it pollutes the water and soil, um, digging up and extracting fossil fuels everywhere from remote locations in South America to um, you know the tar sands of Canada. It produces widespread environmental degradation for God's creation as well as for humans. But then we've got climate change. Where does climate change come in? Well, 200 years ago, a French scientist named Joseph Fourier discovered that our planet should be a frozen ball of ice. And it isn't. And he figured out the reason why. He realized that our planet has this incredible blanket of heat trapping gases that occur naturally. The sun's energy shines down and warms the earth. The earth heats up and gives off heat energy. And our natural blanket traps that heat energy inside the earth, keeping us over 30 degrees Celsius warmer than we would be otherwise. If it were not for this incredible natural blanket, our earth would be a frozen ball of ice and there would be no life whatsoever. So if this blanket is natural, what's the problem? The problem is, is that by digging up and burning increasing amounts of coal and gas and oil every year, we are releasing more and more heat trapping gases into the atmosphere that shouldn't be there. They should be buried deep within the Earth's crust. They shouldn't be up in the atmosphere. And what we're doing is we're essentially wrapping an extra blanket around the planet, a blanket that it does not need and it was never designed to have. And just like you would if someone snuck into your room at night and put an extra blanket on you, you would wake up sweating saying, hey, I'm too warm. I didn't need this. In the same way, we are wrapping an extra blanket around our planet. And that is the reason why it's running a fever. 75% of this blanket comes from the heat trapping gases produced when we burn coal, gas, and oil. 25% of it comes from deforestation. When we burn trees and vegetation, it releases the carbon in them into the atmosphere. And it comes from unsustainable agriculture, especially industrial scale agriculture and livestock cultivation. Cows produce a lot of methane, 90% out the front end, 10% out the back end. And when you allow them to graze, a lot of carbon gets put back into the soil as they graze. But when you herd them all together in industrial agriculture into big pens, they just sit there and produce more and more methane. So because of this extra blanket we're wrapping around the planet, the planet is warming. One year might be warmer or cooler than the next, that's weather, 
But decade by decade by decade, the Earth's temperature is ticking steadily upwards. We don't need thermometers and satellites to measure it. If we look around the world, if we look at the fact that glaciers are melting, that sea ice is thinning and retreating, that pests and invasive species are moving poleward, that trees and flowers are blooming earlier in the year. If we just look at the evidence of God's creation, we can see 26 and a half thousand different independent lines of evidence telling us that yes, the planet really is getting warmer. Now, again, I'm not going to get into the science of, well, what about all of the natural factors? I'm just going to say that we've looked at all of those very carefully. And according to natural factors, we should and we would be getting very gradually cooler right now, but we're not. Instead, we're warming faster than any time in the history of human civilization on this planet. And that's why it matters. Because after the polar bear, we're next. Again, for more of the science, Brittany put a link in the chat to an Arasha USA webinar that I gave um, just at the end of last year. But I want to focus here specifically on how these changes in climate are affecting us. And there are many ways. I have picked just eight. So starting with the first four of eight, how is climate change affecting our air, our water, our food, and our health? We see that it's increasing the risk of heat-related illness and death. It's exacerbating air pollution. It's decreasing the availability and the quality of our food. And it's increasing the spread of diseases that are carried by what we scientists call vectors, which are not arrows. They're like mice, mosquitoes, insects, and other things. Let's look at each one of these briefly. So back in 2003, there was a record-breaking heat wave in Europe. And after the dust cleared, after all the numbers were added up, it turns out that that heat wave was twice as likely because of a warming planet, and it was responsible for 70,000 premature deaths. 70,000. A new study that just came out last month found that climate change is responsible for over one third of heat deaths worldwide already today. It isn't only the temperature though. As it gets warmer, the reactions that turn our tailpipe emissions from cars and from factories, the reactions that turn them into ground level ozone, which is a very dangerous substance for humans to breathe in, those reactions happen faster. These are just two figures from Atlanta and from New York showing that as temperature increases, the further you go to the right, the higher the ozone levels. Why is that? It's because those chemical reactions speed up the warmer it is. We also know around the world that as climate changes, we're seeing increases in crop losses. Anywhere that's an orange, yellow, or red color is seeing decreases. Anywhere that's green is seeing increases. And so what this is doing is, is increasing the inequality. Every year on average since 1980, we've seen about $5 billion worth of crop losses, $5 billion on average every year since 1980 due to climate change. And much of those losses are occurring in low income countries where people live below the poverty line of about two US dollars a day. This is a figure that one of my colleagues, Dave LaBelle created for a National Academy report we did together about 10 years ago. And he showed that as the world gets warmer by one or two or three or four degrees Celsius, different types of crops react differently. If you're concerned about Asian rice or US soybean, they might be just fine up to two degrees Celsius. But if you're concerned about African corn, maize or Indian wheat, you might be seeing decreases of about 25% by two degrees. And it's not only the amount of food, it's the quality of the food. Something that we've just been discovering recently, and there's a really excellent talk from my colleague, Christy Ebby, if you're interested. Uh, maybe Sarah, you could give it a quick Google and put the link in the chat. This is a really good short TED talk. We've been realizing just recently, just the past four or five years, that as carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere increase, that heat trapping gas wrapping an extra blanket around our planet, because CO2 is plant food, it also causes plants to grow faster, but they have the same level of nutrients to draw from. So as the plants grow faster, you might get a bigger squash, 
but that squash has the same amount of nutrients as a smaller squash would have had 50 years ago. So you have to eat more of the squash to get the same level of nutrients. And most people can't afford, in low-income countries especially, to eat more food. So what's happening is their nutrient intake is decreasing, which is increasing the risk of malnutrition. I know that's kind of a little bit complicated to follow, so I strongly recommend this talk if you're interested in knowing more about how the nutritional content of our food is decreasing. And then there's the fact that as it gets warmer, we see mosquitoes, we see ticks, we see carriers of disease spreading poleward, carrying diseases that were previously kept at bay by cold winter temperatures or by high elevation temperatures, even in uh, low latitude areas. So that's the first four. What's the next four? We also see that climate change is increasing the risk of weather disasters. We are also, as flooding increases, as storms get stronger, it's increasing the risk of water contamination and disease that's already responsible for 5 million premature deaths a year around the world. These changes are affecting our mental health and perhaps most critically, they increase the risk of conflict over resource scarcity and refugee crises. What do I mean by that? Well, wherever we live, it's as if we have a pair of dice and we always have a chance of rolling a double six. What is that double six? It's a flood, a storm, a heat wave, a wildfire, um, a drought. It's just a natural part of life on this planet. But as the planet warms decade by decade, it's as if it's sneaking in and taking one of these numbers and turning it into a six and then taking another number and turning it into a six and then taking another number and turning it into a seven. And so all of a sudden you're rolling double six after double six or even a double seven. You're saying, how could this happen? The answer is climate change. As the world warms, warmer air holds more water vapor. So when a storm comes along now, there's more water vapor for that storm to sweep up and dump on us, which is why we're seeing more and more headlines like epic flooding, torrential rain of biblical proportions. <laughs> A third of Bangladesh underwater for the second time. Is the monsoon a natural part of life in Southeast Asia? Of course. Is it natural to have a third of an entire country underwater? No. Does Houston get flooded? Yes. Is it normal to have three 500 year floods in three years? No. Climate change is loading the weather dice against us, taking naturally occurring events and making them bigger or stronger or more frequent or more damaging. One of the biggest headlines these past two years has been the wildfires, the apocalyptic orange skies in the Western United States. The fact that in Australia, it's estimated that over a billion animals were killed during the brush fires in January, 2020. How is climate change loading the dice against us? Climate change doesn't start the fires. A lot of these fires are accidental human ignition, I'm sorry to say. Some others are just lightning. But as the world warms, it is drying out our soils and our vegetation. So think of it this way. Imagine that a match was accidentally dropped into a pile of green, wet wood. What would happen? Not much. Then imagine that a match was dropped into a pile of bone dry kindling. What would happen? It would light on fire. That's the difference between with or without climate change. And we're seeing as a result that the area burned by wildfires is increasing significantly. This is a stunning figure just for the state of California showing the 20 largest wildfires since they started keeping record in 1932. The gray is the area burned by the biggest wildfires from 1932 until 2000. The blue is from 2000 to 2019. And the red is 2020 alone. And right now, California is deeper into drought than it was last year. And the fire season is just beginning. This affects our homes. This affects our resources. It affects our economy. It also affects our health. It's estimated, for example, that last year alone, breathing in the wildfire smoke was responsible for up to 3,000 deaths. Then we've got the fact that sea levels rising. 
Typhoons, cyclones, and hurricanes are getting stronger. They're fed by warm ocean water. And so they're intensifying faster, they're bigger, they've got a lot more rainfall associated with them, and they're creating more damage. The question is not, did climate change cause a given event? The question is, did climate change make it worse? And the answer, nine out of 10 times, is we know that it did. For the United States, we know that without a changing climate, there would have been about 11 million acres burned by wildfires since the 1980s. That's the yellow area there. But with climate change loading the dice against us, we've seen double the area burned. And that yellow area is getting bigger and bigger, or sorry, that orange area is getting bigger and bigger over time. We know with Hurricane Harvey that hit uh, the southern US in 2017, that climate change supersized the rainfall and increased the economic damages. We know that the massive heat wave that engulfed Europe in summer 2019 was five times more likely because of climate change. So back to you now, just to make sure you're paying attention. Back to you. And the link is in the chat if you need it, pollev.com slash Catherine. What have you experienced personally? You can actually pick as many of these as you want. This will allow you to click on, on all of these. Have you personally experienced more extreme heat, stronger rainfall and flooding, more intense storms, cyclones, hurricanes, bigger wildfires, or all of the above? It's hard to experience all of the above unless you move around a little bit because some of them affect people in different places. All right, it looks like we've got a lot of people have experienced more extreme heat. That's a very obvious one. But a third of us, and I include myself in this, we've seen stronger rainfall and more flooding. I've definitely seen that. We see more intense storms and we see bigger wildfires, especially if we live in the Western part of North America, British Columbia, Washington State, Alaska, Oregon, California, or if we live in Australia. We have experienced these ourselves in the places where we live. And this is why it matters because we can see the impact it has on people. Now, we still have about five or six minutes left. Oh, we, we got an E there. We got somebody who's experienced all the above. But I'm going to open up the questions. So you can start asking questions as I finish up now. And here's the fun way that you can ask questions. You type them into PolyV, and you can look at the other questions that other people have asked, and you can upvote the questions that you most want Dave and I to get to at the end. So you can type in your own question or you can upvote somebody else's question. And after I'm done in about five or six minutes here, Dave is gonna come back on and he's gonna be choosing questions from here to talk about. So you can go ahead, this is gonna stay open now. You can go ahead and type your questions in anytime and you can monitor it in your window or in your phone to upvote the questions that you most want us to get to. But I'm not done yet. I need to talk about the last two, and then I want to go back to how we as Christians respond. So I talked, I mentioned earlier very briefly about how this is affecting our mental health. Imagine being caught in a disaster. Imagine losing your home. Imagine losing your home multiple times. Imagine losing the, your ability to feed your family. Eco-anxiety is not only a privilege of those who have the chance to stop and think about what's happening to our world, it is happening to people every day who don't even have the words to express what's happening to them. As they lose their livelihood, they lose their harvest, their wells dry up, they're losing their home, they have nowhere to go. And that's why really, I think the most severe impact of climate change is the fact that with 8 billion people on the planet, we don't really have anywhere else for people to go. People are already being forced to leave their homes. They're already being forced to go elsewhere to look for the basic necessities of life to feed their family. And as we see sea level rising, heat waves becoming more extreme, droughts getting stronger, we see this affecting people. And who is most at risk? This is where the rubber really hits the road. Look at what happens in rich countries. People who have to work outside, people who can't afford to pay their air conditioning bill, people who are sick and disabled, who depend on having electricity or are more vulnerable to disease. Wherever we are, people who already live in extreme poverty, people who don't have access to basic health care, low-income communities here in North America, women and children, especially in poor countries. The bottom line is those who have done the least to contribute to the problem are the most at risk, and that's not fair. 
whether we live in North America or Southeast Asia, whether we live in uh, Texas or Syria, we're experiencing the same type of floods, the same type of droughts, but the impacts are disproportionately greater when they occur in low-income countries. Hurricane Matthew hit North Carolina in 2016. It caused catastrophic flooding, billions of dollars in damage, and it led to the deaths of 28 people. That exact same hurricane had hit the island of Haiti just before it made landfall in the US. It destroyed tens of thousands of homes. It exacerbated the cholera epidemic that was already there. It wiped out the food supply for large areas of the country. The same hurricane caused orders of magnitude more damage because people were already vulnerable. They were already hungry. They were already uh, poor. They already did not have access to clean water or basic health care or cholera vaccines. When we look around the world and we look at where people live in poverty, and then we look at where people are most vulnerable to climate impacts, you can see that it's almost a one-to-one -one correlation. Where climate change hits people the hardest is where people already live in hunger, where people are already dying from lack of access to basic sanitation and clean water, where people are already poor and that poverty is increasing as a result of a changing climate. Since the 1960s, climate change has already increased the gap between the richest and poorest countries by as much as 25%. Just before COVID, the United Nations warned that climate change threatens to undo the last 50 years of development, global health, and poverty reduction. Climate change affects all of us, but it affects the poor and the marginalized the most, and that is profoundly unfair. Why do we care about climate change? We care about it because it's the hole in the bucket. We care about poverty, about hunger, about health, about education, about gender equality, clean water, affordable energy, decent work. Down at number 13, we have climate action, but I don't actually think it should be on the list at all. I would take it out and I would sort of put it as an overarching banner because the only reason we care about climate change is because it exacerbates all of these other issues that we already care about today. So why do we care about a changing climate? We care about it because God has made us responsible for the well-being of every living thing on this planet, Genesis 1. We also care about it because it takes all the risks we face today and it exacerbates them and makes them worse. And we care about it because it affects real people today, especially the poorest and most vulnerable among us. And we know that we are told that we are to be known by what? We are to be known by our love for others. We are to be known by the fact that we walk in love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. So when I think of climate change, when I think of fossil fuels, when I think of the impact that human activities are having on our planet, perhaps the best description I can think of is, it is a failure to love. And that's why who we are as Christians are the perfect people to care about it. It isn't that caring about ecosystem restoration and biodiversity loss and climate change and pollution. It isn't that it's something that everybody cares about or is somehow incompatible with our priorities as Christians. No, if we take the Bible seriously, we would be out at the front of the line demanding climate action because loving is who we are supposed to be. It's who God has made us to be. And it's how we are to be recognized by the world. This was just part one. We've got two more parts coming up tomorrow and the next day, but I'm going to stop here. I'm going to.